Yeah, just give me your thoughts on them. Like, that's it. I just want to, like, get an inside look to, like, your brain as you read this. And, like, especially focusing on why. Okay. So, in essence, giving anonymous critiques on first pages or chapters of things yeah people uh, exactly and how many of these oh no you the, have? I, just, I have way more than I'm gonna go through oh. don't <laughs> yeah um for the next four hours Joshua where am I no okay so that does this one I mean I just randomly selecting which ones I'm giving so you. okay so this is number You're one. Have a lot of quiet time while I just read. Yeah, yeah, no, to I'm totally okay with that. Okay. And do you like need a pen to like annotate no. or? No. So okay, the first one I'm looking at is something with the cataclysm had arrived. Jack okay. thought. Now the first thing you want to be aware of, at least to me, sentence structure. Okay. Um. The first paragraph, especially the sentence structure, I think is a little bit choppy and doesn't quite bring me into the novel as much as you would want. What, um... um okay, so... Choppy, like, how would... Like, how would you, like... You, it, it's hard to say, and that's one of these subjective things. I generally don't like a lot of short, choppy sentences. I like a little variety where you have short sentences when you need them, longer when you need them, but that you have um, this opening paragraph, I find that it gets a little bit too choppy. The other thing which I see just looking at this page is Things don't go together. The narrative jumps around a lot. Mm. So it's the cataclysm arrived, he drew another arrow, he let it fly, he had things to do, and he wasn't going to let these barbarians ruin his plans. Like, if you're in the middle of a battle, you don't usually take time to think about oh, and I forgot to go to the ATM, or something like that. So, so it's kind of like it an seems, info dump. You know, so, so it seems a little awkward there. Later, um, he um, talks about the herb, but it doesn't seem to relate to anything. Um, it's like... Um, if you're reading a Brandon Sanderson novel and people talk about downing metals or something, which mm -hmm. this would remind somebody of, it's very clear what they're doing. Here, um, it's like the details about the herb aren't really being presented in... Uh, in a way that you're moving toward everything, like in a real solid unified way. You don't want to detour here to talk about the name of the herb because mm. you're in the middle of a battle. So if he has some herb, what you might have done is name the herb beforehand or decide you'll deal with the name afterwards but it's like that opening paragraph you're gonna just get the herb out because you need it to win the battle and you're not going to think about what should I call this herb as you begin to use it right um, you know in essence this is like you're trying to escape the bad guy you're seeing a rifle that you can pick up and use to shoot, and rather than just picking up and shoot, choosing to shoot, you decide, well, this rifle I'm about to pick up, is this an Uzi? It is a Kalashnikov? Is it an M16? You wouldn't do that. You would just pick up the 
rifle that was left in the ground or, you know, somebody else died in the rifles. There. You would pick it up and start using it so long as you could figure out where the trigger was and you wouldn't worry about the brand of rifle you were picking up in that moment. Right, so kind of essentially really... I mean, could you maybe categorize that like staying strongly in viewpoint slash character and then kind of like logical... Like sentences need to have a natural... like a, One we, sentence lead, needs to lead to another. Yes. Yes. There was something I read somewhere and I wish I could... Uh, Buried somewhere on my computer, I saved this because it was a very good thing. But the author was basically saying that ideally each chapter or paragraph in a book could not exist without what you found out in the prior. Paragraph or the rest? Or it doesn't book. matter whether it's a chapter by chapter or paragraph by paragraph. Because as I said, I can't remember the exact quote. But that each should directly, you know, follow from the one before. In right. a way that, um, you know, you couldn't have the thing that happened in one place happening else the thing that had happened before right. that happened. On the sentence level, how would that I'm not, again, I'm apply? not saying, I don't ask me if it's sentence or paragraph. All I'm saying is you need to keep that progression in mind. No, right. Well, I, I, I imagine it's a true principle for both. Um, I'm yeah. just trying to think of, like, how it would be, look differently, you know, on a sentence level versus, like, paragraph level. But... Well, I'm just like, you can look at this paragraph and you can safely say that the paragraph jacked down some of the herb that he had ground up earlier could easily go three sentences ahead or a paragraph ahead. It's just, it's mm. not, um, you know, it, it's not... The details aren't essential at the time they're being presented. Right. That's okay. And you Great. can get away with that occasionally. The what begins to be a problem is here it's the pattern that the author needs to break from and improve on. It isn't the, you know, I'm getting away with the slip here or whatever. Right. So Okay. Um, any other things? I mean, those would be the main things, just looking at this. What about stuff that like you liked or that you've, you see him do that not all writers do? I mean, the writing... That's a hard question. When I'm criticizing something, my focus a lot of times is in what you need to do to make it better. Right. And I'm not always good at the hand holding part of it because my focus is making it better. Right. You know, so this is definitely something that, you know, if I had things on a percentile scale, this is in fact better than a considerable amount of stuff that comes into the office or that I've seen in my time. But the main focus really has to be not in saying I'm at the 50th percentile or even at the 70th or 80th percentile when the things that are published are at the 95th percentile for the lucky people. And for most, the 98th or 99th, you have to focus on getting yourself up quite a bit. Right. Not celebrating that you're better, but still not there. Right. So, so 
I don't say that to be negative. No, I just don't make say sense. that to say I'm not gonna focus here on you know handing out uh right. you know little yeah no that that's a great um, point um little you know you know well you don't get a gold star but i'll give you a blue one or a pink one or something i just you know that is not gonna uh, right, okay um that was super helpful so um, do you have more things you want to critique on that, or should we move no, on to I another mean, one? No, I mean, I think that's the main thing that this author needs to think about, is being sure that the details they're presenting are relevant, and that they're telling a story that really does progress in a way where you're not going here to there to there you're actually saying this guy is in the middle of a battle and you're telling us about his battle hopefully giving us some background about why he's fighting the battle giving us some things to learn about himself his character what he's in there's a lot of stuff that needs to be presented and it's hard to do that when the writing seems a little more kind of stream of consciousness. That he's mm. in a battle, but now I'm going to think about um, what the name of the herb is or what other plans I had that night. And I'm harping on these same things because it's only one page. Right. But those are the things in that page onward. Uh, right. Okay? Okay, no. Listen, I don't want to... Perfect. Um, that, no, that's exactly what I'm looking for, Joshua. So... Um, okay. Oh, and actually, I guess before we move on, like... If we're doing a scale from 1 to 10, I'm just trying to get a rough idea. I can't do that. Okay. okay. No, that's Bottom that's line fine. is, if I'm doing a scale on 1 to 10, I'll get back to what I said before. It doesn't matter if I give you a 1, a 3, or an 8. You need to be over a 9. Well over a 9. And anything else, it doesn't matter. So right. to rate, you know, one person a three, one person a seven, both of those grades are failing. Right. Okay, so therefore, no, you know, no numbers, no letters. Right. Okay. Um, okay, um, this one's a little longer. So, okay, the Babbitt thing has one definite strong point going for it, which is there's a real voice to it. Um, and that is always a good thing for a writer when you can present a distinctive voice. Stylistically, this isn't necessarily the kind of thing that I would go for most, but I really do like the fact that there is a voice mm -hmm. on this. Um, I would suspect that... Um, it's supposed to be horror. It's not okay. Horror so, I mean, you can definitely get like a shade of... Um, Tony from The Shining when you're looking at, at Babbitt. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that little voice inside of your head, etc. Um, you know, so I don't know where it's going, but I'm at least, as I said, intrigued by the presence of like a real voice coming through with the writer. And the other thing that I would just maybe say here is to be sure that you're making every word 
account. And um, does she have lots of sentences that essentially say the same thing? It's not entirely saying the same thing. It's just that it's almost in some ways like a parable when he's talking about things. And I just, somewhere along the way, like let's say when he's talking about finding the scissors, there might be a little TMI there, which keeps from getting to the actual point of this scene What's TMI? of the book. Too much information. Mm -hmm. um, that would be something to watch out for. Um, the other thing is, again, like the progression of information to watch out for is that um, on the second page there was the by now I was used to Babbitt's many forms. I'm not entirely sure why we get that information here instead of having it right at the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. Babbitt was, myth was with was with me from the beginning. I don't remember it, but he says he watched me in my cradle and even then we knew. He couldn't explain what it was that drew him to me, but he says that's not uncommon. Um, it seems to me that the stuff about by now I was used to Babbitt's many forms wants to go somewhere in there. Right. Instead of kind of coming as an interruption within the actual parable of the um, right. of the sacrifice no, that, that makes he's sense. telling. So those are a few points there. As I said, though, definitely I, I always like finding a writer with a really distinguishing voice. This author in particular, like how close did you say like she's like this story imagine she did she, same he, quality I don't know who <laughs> would you like would this be nearly publishable or well again I'm only looking at two pages right right and it wouldn't be entirely my cup of tea this sort of book even if it was really working what I will say is I like the fact that the writer is able to present a real voice. And that's something, you know, that is, that is good. Okay. Okay. Uh. So, okay, the thing with the Silver Dragon is another example, in a way like the first one, the writing isn't progressing smoothly. The style itself could work within a really strong context. It's a little bit more kind of, you know, putting it all out there, uh, you know, hard in the sleeve kind of thing, very emotionally like unreserved kind of writing that can work like romance as an example is a genre where you'll often have writing like that more than in some other genres um, but you can't have something like um, she's on the dragon it's diving the war was over, but Daxon was gone, and nothing would bring her husband back. She stopped along the way and buried him in a meadow beneath the great tree. Who, well, where has he been? Is the husband on the dragon with her? Did she escape the, um, you know, diving dragon... And then the husband's body was just waiting by where it was buried, and she just stopped there and buried him. Um, 
Now, I'm coming in on page three, according to what's here, unless... Oh, no, that's, th th that's the just the numbering the page. Oh, okay. Uh, this is the beginning okay, of the Okay, okay. So, um, so, it's just, there's no real stage setting. Mm. You don't know where she is. It appears that she's in a fight. There's the body that comes out, and you don't know where the body is. So, the writing could be okay, but there's definitely the need to stop and slow down a bit. Um, hmm. One thing writers will do sometimes, and I think this is one reason why... I don't like dialogue-heavy books. This page isn't, but it reminds me of that in a way that the disadvantage of writing really heavy on dialogue is that you also need to give visual clues and paint pictures to a reader to mm. some extent. And that is the big thing here that is missing is a real strong sense of visualization. Right. I can't actually see any of the things that are going on. Right. Or at least not in a specific sense. Right. She's on a dragon, she's diving. But I don't have any other cueing beyond right. that. Okay. Um, does it start with enough of a bang? Would you say, or like, I mean, if this is the first chapter, is she grabbing your attention enough? Well, so. The first sentence, the silver dragon circled high in the sky above the lightning plains. There's nothing wrong with that sentence, but even after finding out she tucked her wings into her side and dove, I don't know if she is tucking in her wings, meaning literally that she has wings and she is tucking them in, or if she is tucking in the wings of the silver dragon, or if she is riding another dragon and is trying to escape the silver dragon that is introduced in the first sentence. Right. So... Could a book start with this first sentence? Totally. The question is what you tell me in the next sentences after that. Okay, no, that makes sense. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so the one here... Um, There's a sign of a voice, which I like. There... So, the second sentence, it should be phased, the spirit had said. There's punctuation that's missing. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's just a comma, and it should be phase, comma, the spirit had said. But without the punctuation, you give me a sentence that is really awkward. Hmm. Right. The next paragraph... <sighs> So getting back to what I said earlier about a progression, the stuff about the phase in the first, like, paragraph doesn't seem to have any payoff in the second paragraph. Like, who are the phase? What are the phase? I'm assuming 
because I've read a lot of fantasy novels that you're meaning fairies of some sort, but I just don't know. It's really, um... So, it was almost like he hinted at something, but didn't deliver on it. Doesn't deliver on it in the second paragraph. If he would have been, ex imagine like he would have um, been more explicit hanging like a lantern on it, would that have been acceptable? But he didn't, like, for instance, he said, like, blah, 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 the phase, blah, blah, but he didn't have time to think about that right now. And then he goes on. I don't know. It, it's just that all in all, there's just less of a flow here than with a lot of the other, with the things I've read so far. There are a lot of different actions that are taking place. But I'm not getting a good sense on how it all connects up. So maybe like the, the visual context and the motives? It needs, as I said, the, it's action, but it isn't... It seems to be circling instead of going forward. Okay. Do have you do you see that very often in novels, like kind of action, kind of circling, but not going? Well. You see a lot of things. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I imagine it happens like so. It's just it, it it it's going in circles, and I don't know that I've gotten any further in Nalada's story at the end of these paragraphs than I am at the beginning of it. Mm, right. Okay. Um, what, what would be like a thing that, just extrapolating, what would be a thing that would make you feel like you had gotten farther in the plot? Like, I mean, you can make up a plot. Like, can I you imagine? It's, it's, again, it's, a, it's just, you want to ha have forward movement, and I really didn't feel that here. So, like, what does forward movement look like? Maybe it's like, um, <laughs> conflict isn't, like, there's no conflict in the process of being resolved. I mean, I wonder. Well, that would be part of it. But that's, as I said, that's what plotting is about, though. It's giving... Plotting is a clothesline that you hang things on. Mm. And without a plot to hang things on, you're just not, you know, mm. you're not getting anywhere. So, like, action needs to take place in context of the overall plot. Yes. God, no, that makes perfect sense. So, on this one, there's a great opening paragraph. Okay, Mara thought to herself, it's nothing to be scared of. Just keep looking forward. Smile. And above all, don't draw attention to yourself. Don't draw attention yet anyways. It's a very solid opening paragraph. There's a voice there. You're kind of taken into Mara instantly. I don't know if I would have the don't draw attention to yourself, don't draw attention yet anyways. If you need to say that, you can certainly say it quicker. Even if it's just three words quicker, you want to be in the business of making every word count. So I would ask, you know, and above all, don't draw attention to yourself. Not right now. As an example, would be two words quicker, but it at least doesn't mm -hmm. repeat the don't draw attention yet anyways. Right. It adds without repeating, and it saves two words. The problem here is that after that, and after a second paragraph that is kind of okay, but falls off, 
she spends all of this time talking about the building was absolutely enormous. Hundreds of pillars, illimitable distance, spider-like veins of burnished copper mesh. I want to know from the first paragraph why Mara doesn't draw attention to herself, doesn't mm -hmm. want to draw attention to herself, and you are now completely ignoring that. Mm. Right. Now, I also said that you need to paint pictures, but this isn't the time or place for it. You need to build on what you've told us and get down to the brass tacks of explaining the situation Mara is in where she doesn't want to draw attention to herself. And that doesn't exclude giving visual cueing mm -hmm. because you can take a little bit of time to say it would be hard to draw attention to you'd think it would be hard to draw attention to yourself in a room with um you know um where the ceiling stretched upwards for an illimitable distance, where the assembly hall could hold her and, you know, 300,000 of her fellow 17-year-olds. But if there was a way to do it, Mara knew she could find it. You know, so that's an example of a way where you can offer some visuals, describe the situation, but not make the reader feel like you're detouring from your really good yeah. first paragraph. Right. So kind of like they should really be doing multiple things at once. Yeah, a good writer is able to do things where you, you know... Where you provide the visuals that give the context, the direct and immediate context to where Mara finds herself, but not stop for, um, you know, 50 <laughs> words, 100 words that don't go anywhere beyond that good opening paragraph. Right. So, was, okay, so like, in lots of ways, lack of progression, but... Yeah. And because And then she detours to talking about some other small girl, you know, um, they all look the same, you know, it's just, what is it with Mara? Tell me more about this. Okay. Okay, then so in this one here, there's a some mix of good and bad in this. It's first person. I'm interested by the character. It seems like a really interesting character whom I'd like to get to know. So he's in the guard. He has this post other people wouldn't ask for. There's a mission. There's a lot of stuff here that I'm interested in getting to find out more of. Hmm. At the same time, um, overlooking the slum-like sidings, would slum-like be one word in this context. I think so. Dangerous during the day, suicide by night, especially for the watch. Um, now, I don't know if you need to make slum like one or two words. You could probably just cut out both and say overlooking the sightings. Dangerous during the day, 
suicide by night, especially for the watch. Or you could leave out, especially for the watch. I'm not sure that piece of information needs to be given right at that particular time. A storm was coming, not tonight, but soon. Tonight the air was crisp and clear, the moon. Well, if the storm isn't coming right now, and if it isn't directly relevant to what is about to happen, then leave it out. A storm is always coming. You know, wherever you are, there's always a storm coming. Maybe it's next week, or maybe the monsoon season begins in three months. There's always a storm coming. A chill wind blew in from the east, whipping strands of hair. I cover the lower half to prevent the black smoke belching from chimneys from an acrid gunk in my mouth and nose. Raucous laughter, lantern light silhouetted, um, drunken stupor. There are a lot of adjectives here, and I'm not sure you need all of them. Mm -hmm. It's not it, it may be, but I'm not sure. There are certainly enough of them that I begin to get suspicious. Hmm. Um, the fourth paragraph talks a lot about lantern light situated working girls, images of my mother returning home. No doubt girls I'd grown up with were whoring inside was one of the silhouettes Davram Alder. I, if our information was correct, and he was there. If you're thinking about the guy, why does the previous paragraph talk mostly about the girls? It's a subtle thing but if you're worried about the guy, you want to have details that focuses on the patrons who get one mention while the girls get three. And it's not that anything is necessarily wrong with either paragraph. It's just that they don't connect entirely to one another. Right. right. The others were out there somewhere. My squad, concealed in college, Gabe and Hal were too adept at hiding unless I really wanted to even. Now, this is again another example of a detail. Is this the place for it? Do you want or do you want to move that upwards because the important thing to do is actually establish that he is part of a squad? Right now you do that with the especially for the watch, so you know he's probably in the watch, but the better way might be to say you know, dangerous during the day, suicide by night. The others were out there somewhere. My squad concealed in the alleyways and shadows. That's, in my opinion, a much stronger way to present the information. How does he do it right there? The, so is that, so it's is that just more, a question of moving, yeah, like moving that establishing information. The author clearly knows that she wants to establish that the character is in the watch. But right now, she does that with four extraneous words rather than just bringing us right to the point that he is in the watch and the others in his squad are out there. Right. Okay. So, 
So those are some general thoughts here. There's definitely some strengths in this one, but there's also a lot that, you know, still right. keeps it from, from being entirely successful. Right. Okay. Um, I think that's probably it. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much, Joshua. That was super helpful. Exactly what I was like. Super helpful. Exactly what I was like. Super helpful. Exactly what I was like. Super helpful. Exactly. Um, so since I don't have any, like, plot outlines, I really should have maybe brought some. Um, could you maybe just talk about, like, what is a good plot? And, like, what, kind of what, I mean... There's no one thing that makes a good plot or a good book. And right. different writers have different strengths. There are a gazillion books that talk about the ingredients of a good plot. When I started in the industry, the Bible I used was a book called Writing to Sell by Scott Meredith, long out of print, but you can find, you know, plenty of used copies in the internet. And if you overlook some of the, uh, like, advice in preparing a manuscript that dates back 40 years to when people used typewriters, what that book describes is an identifiable lead character confronting an important problem that must be solved but which cannot due to a series of rising complications. Hmm. Your resolution comes about when the lead character finds the internal resources to surmount the rising obstacles and complications and solve the problem and bring about the resolution. Hmm. Do you kind of subscribe to that definition? Well, I mean, the not, 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 not like dogma. Is but. That if you look at plotting for most books, most films, where they follow this even more closely under like Robert McKee's story structure, this new guy who, you know, theoretically tells you exactly what page the beats in the classic Hollywood plot need to happen on. That basic framework is a very good framework for analyzing commercial fiction. But it is important to keep in mind that there is no one way to having a book that people want to read. Right. Um, so, like, one of the biggest mistakes people will make is if you don't understand why a particular writer works, you are unable to replicate it you will decide people are reading Robert Ludlum in his, you know, classic days because he was a wonderful prose stylist, which he wasn't, and not because of his ability to just come up with a really grabby plot hook. You can even read a book like The Firm by John Grisham, which has a very bad ending. It just kind of meanders around, and Mitch is in one place, and the brother that he was saving from jail is in some other place, and he never confronts the bad guys of the book, and you certainly don't want to emulate the ending. What you want to emulate is the first ten pages. They're just is not a much better first 10 pages to a book than the first 10 pages of the firm. Um, another example of this, um, you look at the first book 
in George R. R. Martin's You Look at the Game of Thrones. George R. R. Martin drowns you in detail, and this is in some ways a fault of his if you decide to emulate that too rigorously. Most authors won't carry it off. One of the things that allows George R. R. Martin to carry it off is that his detailing tends to be very visual and immersive. So whatever else you can say about it, it helps to paint a picture of the world you're in. And if you look at the opening pages of the first book, he spends a lot of time talking about like the slippery ground that the characters are walking on. And you can argue too much time. But when it gets to the sword fight in that opening scene, he has at least established very well the terrain on which the battle is taking place. So when you get to reading that battle, you understand and have a full visualization of it in your mind. I don't suggest trying to be George R. R. Martin, but if you're going to be, understand that he doesn't work just because he gives you detail. It works because he gives you very, very visual detail that helps to immerse you in his world and understand what is happening. Right. Similarly, just to get back to the basics of a plot, you can have a character that you don't identify with, but maybe give that character a really strong plot problem. Or you cannot have the strongest plotting ability in the world, but you are a brilliant writer and people therefore will help carry over that stuff where, you know, you're not as good. Right. There are all of these ingredients and you're having to balance and compensate them. Um, I was just doing a little read over for a manuscript from somebody my assistant met with at Worldcon. And he's a really good line by line writer. And you don't really notice for a long time that he's done a much less good job of establishing who his lead character is, or characters, and you know, that's the kind of thing that works, but I don't think it will work for a 180,000 word fantasy novel. Ultimately, I think probably you need a stronger foundation, but the sheer ability to just write helps a lot to hide the fact that the plotting may not be equally good. Mm. Right, so, I mean, so like, I mean, you can't maybe think of plot as the macro level. Sometimes the micro level can kind of carry you through, even if your macro level is not Writers so are compensating for their strengths and weaknesses all the time. Right. And the best writers are the ones who either have no weaknesses or just have very good strengths somewhere. Right. The John I was intrigued by when you mentioned John Grisham the firm, like what made those first ten pages so good? Like kind Well, of it's been a while since I read them. But you just instantly are caught up, like Mitch McDear's character is sketched so instantly as being very identifiable. You know, put himself through law school, looking for a job, has those loans to pay off. I mean, it's just all sketched right there. And just with an incredible economy of words, 
he has this job offer that just really seems too good to be true. And the whole process of just laying it out, which if you just watch the opening minutes of the movie, the movie carries across the spirit of the book very well. And I've always actually liked the book in some ways more than the movie because they fix the ending. A lot of people at the time yelled at the movie because it did not have the same ending as the book, but I always harbored a great admiration that they recognized the fact that the ending of the book sucks, and they gave the movie an ending where Mitch McDear is in the office talking to the bad guys and clearly with his wits solving his own problem telling them you have these billing errors and this makes me your client and as your you know attorney i can't talk and he comes up with his own solution to the problem in the book never quite really works that way. It's just like the problem goes away without him ever directly fixing it. Hmm, right. Okay, so it was really good at establishing that problem really early and just really identifiable. Like, yeah. You resonate yeah, with the problem. Yeah, but if you look at the plot as it goes along, it gets shakier. And to talk about another John Grisham, the Pelican Brief, the entire plot there relies on the artificial withholding of information, which is one of the things that you are recommended against for very good reasons, because you have to explain, you know, people generally notice that, well, gee, if these people would just talk to one another, everything would be fixed, so why am I reading the book? But again, that's an example of John Grisham having so many things he does really, really well that you don't notice in the thrill of the moment some of the things he doesn't do so well. Right. But if you're ever like told by me to revise a novel and you come back and say, well, what's wrong with my entire book resting on people not knowing something that they could find out on page five? Because that's what John Grisham does in the Pelican Brief. I'm going to throw you out of my office because you've got to be aware to be able to understand that what works for him, what works for George Martin, what works for Patrick Rothfuss or Brandon Sanderson or Simon Green is not something that will necessarily work for you. Right. Okay, that makes perfect sense.